now it's green? Better? Okay, fine. Um, so, you know, on this interface of physics and, and machine learning, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of activity that goes in the other direction. That is, you know, physicists from different subfields of physics applying various techniques of, of machine learning to their problems of, of interest. And uh, this is where this talk uh, uh, really fits in. But uh, sort of our little peculiarity is that we don't just take, uh, you know, let's say some models of machine learning that, you know, people have developed and just throw it randomly at, at the problem that we're interested in. Instead, we find it sort of much more useful to have sort of intermediate la layer. And this intermediate la layer is, is a level of formalization in terms of uh, information theory. And I'll try to, to show why this would be useful. But roughly, it's because, you know, the things that we are interested in in physics, you know, the, not all things in physics, but the particular ones that we're interested in, uh, admit this kind of level of formalization in, in terms of notion of information theory. And once this is done, it is kind of much more amenable to computations using machine learning methods in, in a way that we actually understand, uh, you know, what we're computing as, as opposed to having to answer, you know, sort of questions like, you know, what did the machine learn or something of that sort. Okay, so this is going to be the, the content of, of, of this talk and hopefully I'll be able to explain to you, you know, what is the, you know, wh what are those pictures uh, uh, and, you know, what, what do they mean. Um, but this is not to say that, uh, you know, I'm completely disinterested in, in the other direction. In fact, we have done just a little bit of work in that. So, so we, we uh, uh, were interested in the problem of hyperparameter optimization, how one can, you know, use some physical methods to do that. So if anyone is interested, I, I will be able to talk about it, but not now. So without further ado, let me, uh, uh, you know, go to the main subject of this talk. Uh, uh, and uh, let me give you a one slide introduction to RG. I assume that a lot of you know RG better than, than I do, but I also know that there are some people who are not even physicists, so I think it's, it's, it's necessary. So RG stems from a very simple, but n you know, nevertheless very profound observation that a physical system, which is you know, probed or observed at a different energy scale or different length scale, looks different. But nevertheless, it's always the same system. Therefore, there has to exist some form of you know, conceptual relation linking the description of the system in terms of Hamiltonians, for instance, at various length scales. Okay, so, so this, this conceptual relation is formalized in the notion of uh, RG flow in the space of Hamiltonians or in the space of, you know, coupling constants or, you know, possibly more complicated objects. So what's, what's pictured here is some sort of, you know, caricature RG flow for some fictitious system. So what, what you see is, you know, there are some sort of, you know, Hamiltonians and they, you know, they, they flow under the iterations of this RG transformation. I mean, not telling you yet what this RG transformation is or what it is supposed to achieve, but uh, what I want to uh, sort of transmit is that generic features of such RG flows have sort of real physical significance in that uh, fixed points of RG uh, transformations uh, correspond to stable phase of matter if they're stable fixed points or to critical phases, phase transitions if, if, if they're unstable, the, you know, directions of the flow around the critical points define what are the perturbations which can be, you know, irrelevant or relevant driving the system to a different phase. So what RG really does is somehow provides a, a proper theoretical language to talk about notions like universality in condensed matter physics, right? which is a very important idea, you know, that, that we can talk about, say, properties of a physical phase in the abstract without caring about microscopic details, right? without having to, to derive a completely new theory for every individual realization of, of the system that differs just by a speck of dust, right? which, which technically you know, should be what, we, you know, uh, what, what one should be doing. And another important thing to, to note is that, you know, even though it's called the randomization group, it's a complete misnomer. First, there is, not, there is no group in this whole story. And more importantly, it's not a theory. There isn't a single RG. It's, it's more of a framework of ideas. In fact, there are many different kinds of RGs. You know, they, uh, they deal with different objects. There are things which happen in Fourier space. Uh, there's like Wilsonian RG. There are things which deal with entanglement and, you know, and, and properties of wave functions like DMRG. We are going to be interested in perhaps the simplest kind of realization of RG, uh, as, as you learn in basic statistical mechanics, and that is real space RG of, of statmec uh, uh, systems. Okay, and so, you know, this is some sort of picture of Kadanov block style uh, real space RG. But what is important to, to, to realize is that, you know, for all this kind of di diversity and richness of, of, of this framework, you know, there is a certain blueprint, right? There is a cer certain set of common ideas that they all share, and this common motif is that RG is uh, uh, an iterative procedure. Uh, uh, where effectively you divide your degrees of freedom into two sets, which I will kind of by abuse of terminology call slow and fast, and then you integrate out, let's say, the fast in order to obtain an effective theory in terms of the remaining degrees of freedom. And the idea is that if you iterate this procedure and if you set up the procedure correctly, whatever that means, uh, that ultimately at the end of this process you will derive an effective theory that governs the properties of the system at the longest length scales, or at the lowest energy scales, which is exactly what condensed matter physics is about, properties of the system at you know, uh, low energies. So when you phrase it 
this, this framework uh, like this. It's, it's almost obvious that it has something to do with infor information theory, in particular with compression, because this integrating out is a form of lossy compression of, of information, where the information about sort of you know, irrelevant microscopic short range fluctuations is progressively washed out. And the only information that is supposed to you know, be preserved uh, along the flow is the one that will ultimately characterize the properties of the fixed point. So it's a, it's a sort of a very nice intuition to, to think about RG. But of course, the, the, the really important question is, can one, you know, can one formalize this intuition in, in any way? And even more importantly, uh, it, you know, so beyond kind of aesthetical value, whether from such a formalization anything useful would flow, either some sort of a theoretical insight or perhaps a sort of a, you know, a constructive uh, or, or you know, numerical algorithm that one could perform. So of course, what I'll try to convince you is, is, is that this is indeed the case and one can learn something by, by, uh, by performing this kind of mental exercise. And so this goes, well, we call it the real space mutual information algorithm. Well, real space because it's about real space RG and mutual information because that's kind of the most important object that we're going to be using. Uh, but I, I'll tell you exactly uh, which kind of mutual. You want to have users in what direction? You want to see that uh, this link between RG and information theory works in what direction? From information theory to theory? Well, no, I want to, I, I want to, um, I basically want to construct a better RG. Oh. Uh, let's, let's put it this way. I, I, I want, I want to, I want to construct a better numerical RG, and I uh, uh, want to uh, understand also theoretically why it's better, like why it's actually doing what, what I'm claiming it's, it's doing. So, you know, I, I could be just satisfied with some empirical numerical algorithm, but I want to see what are the connections between, uh, you know, things that we know from standard RG theory, notions like relevance, to uh, quantities that you would compute in the information theoretic language. Okay, so that, that is what I'll try to show you. So in this, you know, this, what I'm showing here is basically the outline of the rest of the talk, and uh, I am absolutely not going to be able to, to cover uh, everything, so I'm gonna you know, cut off at some point, I hope uh, uh, large enough. But it goes into two directions. So first, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll describe the kind of the basic setup, what is exactly that, that we're doing, so that we can actually you know, start talking concretely about what's, uh, what's going on. So, and then I'll, uh, then I'll actually tell you how once this is set up, one can actually try to construct a numerical algorithm that does this. So in particular, in this numerical algorithm, this kind of coarse graining RG algorithm, certain quantities that come from information theory needs to, need to be evaluated. And this is where machine learning comes in. We're actually going to be using certain machine learning methods to evaluate those quantities efficiently, numerically efficiently, ba basically meaning fast and, you know, and, and accurately. And I, I'll show you some examples of application this to physical systems, where I, of course, try to justify that it's actually finding things that are meaningful. Um, and you know the, the things that it that, you know the things that it finds the, the the objects that it constructs are certain representations compressed representations of the information in the system. So uh, what I what I'll you know perhaps have time to to tell you is that you know if you you know you can examine those representations and you can kind of look at them and stare and realize oh this is what I expected right it's it's great but if you if you tried it on a system that you wouldn't know then perhaps you wouldn't you wouldn't understand what you're looking for. But what I actually try to show is that you can actually perform data analysis on those objects that you construct. And you can kind of understand what are sort of the relevant things that, that it finds in a, in a slightly more unbiased way. And I'll try a to talk a little bit about applications. Then there is a theoretical counterpart to all this. So, you know, there is some numerical algorithm. It's doing something. You would want to uh, have some belief that it's actually doing, uh, you, know, uh, you know, something something useful and something that really does pertain to uh, to RG. And in order to, 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 well, you know, prove that, of course, not to any mathematical standard, I'll try to, to um, show that this algorithm is quite related to the so-called information bottleneck framework in, in compression theory. Uh, so basically, I'll, I'll try to show that what we're doing is a limit, is a sort of very, is a limit of IB under some, some constraints. And then I'll try to show, you know, in, in information bottleneck, there's this notion of relevant information that you're going to preserve. So it's a compression that tries to preserve relevant information. Now, in RG, there is also a notion of relevance, right? You know, there are relevant operators. So of course you might ask, is there anything you know, between those two things? Are they connected in any way? So what I'll try to show you is that not only they're connected, they're effectively the same. So the information that you pick up from IB framework is the information pertaining to the relevant operators uh, in RG. And then there is another thing which I'm 100% certain I will not be able to get to, which is you know, we started uh, thinking about this, this process as in a very practical terms. We want to construct an optimal RG from some point of view. Well, optimal from what point of view? What we had in mind is that you know you often deal with you know Hamiltonians and you know RG constructs some sort of you know renormalized Hamiltonians and they can get very nasty. So what we can show, well at least in examples, is that if you do RG this way, your Hamiltonians are you know the least complex. They they 
you know, you, you generate the, the least additional terms or interactions that you can under the constraints that, that you're working, okay? So that's what we call uh, uh, optimality in this setting. Okay, so now let us be really, uh, let us be a little bit more concrete and let's focus on real space RG of classical statistical mechanical systems. So the real space RG that, that we're performing proceeds by dividing the system into spatial blocks and constructing an effective description of, of the block in terms of uh, some smaller set of new degrees of freedom, okay? So this, uh, this is called coarse graining and then deriving an effective theory in terms of those coarse grain degrees of freedom, okay? So what's, what's pictured here is some you know, physical system, which I you know, in collectively denote by X, and it's given to us as a probability distribution, P of X, which here is, you know, is Gibson. It comes from some underlying Hamiltonian, but we actually do not need access to the Hamiltonian. We just need the probability distribution, in fact, the samples. And what's pictured here is you know, some area, some block of system V, which is currently being coarse grained, and it's smaller representation H. The degrees of freedom in H do not even have to be of the same kind as the ones in V. That's, that's your choice, okay? So what you're trying to do is you're trying to compress information V into, into H, and this coarse graining of compression, we formalize it as a conditional probability distribution, P, H, conditional on V, and there could be many of them, so it, in particular it might depend on some parameters, okay? So I will explain other, other elements of this picture as, as their time comes. So if somebody gives you this coarse graining probability distribution, this RG transformation, if you, if you wish, so how can you derive the sort of the new effective theory? Well, it's very simple. You take the original probability distribution, you multiply it by the coarse graining transformation on all the blocks, you trace out over the original degrees of freedom. That defines you the new probability distribution in terms of the new degrees of freedom and implicitly defines, let's say, the, the new Hamilton, the new randomized Hamilton in terms of new degrees of freedom. So now I told you that, you know, perhaps you can do this transformation many ways. So does the choice of the RG transformation matter? Well, from the practical standpoint, it matters a lot because the way you choose, you know, how H depend on V influences the form of your renormalized Hamiltonian. And what can happen is that even if the original Hamiltonian was completely trivial, and even actually if the fixed point is described by a trivial Hamiltonian, perhaps even the same Hamiltonian, just with, you know, changed coupling constants, then if you choose your RG transformation the wrong way, then your RG transformation that you're performing will generate a, a mess in your normalized Hamiltonian. You'll, you'll, you'll have you know, higher order or longer range interacting terms, right? And very quickly you'll lose any form of analytical numerical control and you'll not be able to carry out this procedure in practice. This is not just like a theoretical construct, you're really supposed to carry out the RG procedure in, in practice. So the simplest example of that you can think of is just think of one easing model, think of you know, blocking, blocking the spins and construct, constructing a block spin, okay? The nearest neighbor 1D easing model. You know that the solution for that is decimation, right? So you basically only retain one of the spins in the block, any one actually. You, reg you, you forget about the other ones. And that's, that's your coarse grained variable. If you do it uh, like this, you, you realize that the Hamiltonian you obtain will be of the exactly same form with just a renormalized coupling constant. And that gives you an equation for the flow of the coupling constant. And that, for example, can teach you that there is no phase transition, right? There, there, there are no two phases in 1D uh, uh, easing model. But if you do anything but decimation, then you'll immediately generate, you know, longer range inter uh, uh, interactions in, in the system, right? Now, on the other hand, if you do decimation in 2D easing model, it will not work wor very well at all. There are actually better transformation. So traditionally, choosing this RG transformation is a bit of an art, and basically it's a problem, it's a, it's a separate problem for every system, how to construct one. So of course the question is, you know, is there a sort of a principled way to do it? Is there some sort of general guiding principle that, that will tell you what should be the, the correct RG transformation, meaning, you know, the correct way of extracting the, the information from your system that, that is tuned to the particular system that you're studying as opposed to some sort of God-given rule, okay? And so, yes, there is. I mean, that's, that's what I want to argue. So how would you go about that? Well, you need to take a step back and you need to understand like, what, is that you, what is that you want, right? You, out of this whole procedure, you want to understand what are the long-range properties of the system. So that is what you care for and you don't care about anything else, right? Now, how do you go about this? You go about this by, by compressing the information uh, in the block, right? So therefore, if you're constructing this compression, you shouldn't just take any compression, random compression or something like this, right? You should take the compression that exactly preserves the kind of information that you want and, and discards the, the information that, that sort of pertains to short range uh, details of the system, right? So, you know, it's very clear, right, that what that this can be phrased as some form of optimization problem, whatever is my sort of, uh, you know, f uh, ansatz family for, the, for this coarse grain probability distribution, I should choose its parameters, well here, I, I chose to call them something, it doesn't really matter. You should choose the parameters lambda in such a way that this new constructed degrees of, d you know, the degree of freedom, H, tracks what I would call the slow degrees of freedom within V, or, or basically more formally, tracks what V knows about long-range physics. Well, 
That's fine, but then you ask, okay, so how do you define what V knows about long-range physics, right? What does, what is those? So this is not something that is intrinsic to V. You cannot define what V knows about the long-range property of the system by looking at the V itself, right? What you need to do is you need to look about on, on the interactions with V with the rest of the system. And that is, and that is exactly the, the, the idea of this buffer. So we introduce, and it has to be non-zero thickness shell around, uh, around the system, which effectively introduces a length scale in the problem. And everything that lies beyond the, beyond the buffer is the environment of the block. And you say, well, I fix some length scale, some, some, uh, some thickness of the buffer, and I define that the long range information that the block possesses about the rest of the system is the mutual information it has with the environment. Right? So I'm really, I'm really asking, you know, think of that the buffer is actually large, maybe infinite. Right? So I'm asking what V knows about the infinite environment. That's the long range information that's contained in V. It can be measured by, let's say, mutual information between V uh, and E. And now your compression should be such that you retain as much as possible of that information. So you can formalize this by saying, and this is what we, what we call here the spatial mutual information, right? This information beyond the buffer. So you can, at the end of the day, you can phrase it as a, as a variational problem, right? What you say, I'm going to optimize whatever ansatz for the coarse-grained probability distribution I have by, by maximizing over, the, over those parameters the mutual information between the new coarse-grained degree of freedom and the environment of the block. And I kind of emphasize, I don't care about preserving any sort of random information from, from V. I'm, I'm only interested in preserving what V knows about the environment. Okay, so that sounds, uh, you know, very kind of uh, 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 well. That sounds intuitive. I, I, I think, you know, you know, it's a it's a good motivation. So what I will proceed now is to describe how you would actually do it in practice, that you would re realize it as a, as an algorithm. Then I'll show you how it works in practice on on some systems. You know, basically I'll try to show that it does work. And then at the end I'll try to kind of make it a little bit more formal and says, you know, there are go those good intuitions preserving long-range long range information, but in RG we actually have much more formal notions, right? Like let's, let's say the scaling operators and stuff like this. So how is it related to that? So I'll try to come to that uh, towards the end. But first let's, let's talk about the algorithm. So there are sort of three building blocks in this whole story, right? First, the most important is this cost, well, is this optimization problem, which I call the cost function, right? So this mutual information with the environment, right? And the definition of the block, of, of the buffer. So the buffer, Sounds like it's a super boring thing, but it's actually the most important thing in this whole talk, right? It's it's the filter which 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 kind of you know filters out what's 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 short and what's uh, what's uh, long range, okay? So there is this cost function, but we then we need two other elements. We need to have some good ansatz for the uh, for the coarse grain probability distribution, and we need to have some way to compute that 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 information. And hopefully we have to choose in such a way that this is actually computable, you know, nicely, right? In the sense that you know you you can actually do it for some system that you that you're interested in. And I, but I want to emphasize that, that you know, basically the whole setup, the conceptual setup is already here, right? This is just technical details how we do it. In fact, before we did it in a different way with, with RBMs and some very ho ad hoc estimation of mutual information, it still worked, but it was extremely slow. Now I'll try to show you how you can, you know, reading up a little bit more on, on sort of uh, 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 some, some recent developments in machine learning, you can do it in a nice and sort of, you know, uh, streamlined way. So. Okay, so basically the, the kind of the flow of the, of the algorithm is something like this, right? You start from some configurations of the system that you're interested in. So here, you know, in, in experiments, we of course do Monte Carlo of, 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 of the system, which is of course some, some sort of shortcoming, but you could, you, you know, you hope that once you make it kind of really, you know, efficient, then you perhaps will be able to work with, you know, experimental data, let's say samples, some, you know, measurement configuration from some uh, soft condensed matter system, something like that. So once you're given those samples, this is the input. You, you, you have your initial guess for the, uh, for the coarse graining rule, right? So, so you apply the coarse graining rule to the samples. You construct your kind of coarse grain samples. You compute the, an estimate of, of the mutual information they have, you know, uh, uh, you know the, the new variables with, with the environment of, of each block you, you define. In fact, you're not so much interested in, in the estimate of that information. You're really in interested in its gradients because you're going to use those gradients to improve your ansatz for the coarse graining probability distribution, right? And so you, it, and now the way I'm saying it, it seems like there is a fixed, uh, fi fixed estimator, but the estimator can be, you know, can be improved itself in those iterations. In fact, this is what we're going to be doing, okay? And then basically you iterate this whole thing until convergence, and then at the end of the day, you have your trained, uh, you know, RG rule, which you can then use to really coarse grain those those, pro those configurations, and you can maybe do it iteratively. And if you do it, you know, wh wh what can you do with that? Well, I mean, you, you have your sort of uh, configurations of the system at, at larger length scale, so you might start computing immediately some correlation functions because, let's say, that's what you're interested in. 
but you might also be interested in, in, in examining how your uh, Hamiltonian change, right? That's a separate problem, but one can, one can do it. It's a difficult problem because now you're asking, you know, given this coarse grain probability distribution, you're asking what is the normalized Hamiltonian that, that, that belongs to this. So this is a, a, an example of an inverse problem, but we kind of have solved this in, in some little examples. Apparently there's also a, you know, a bit of progress in machine learning on that related to learning graphical models. So one can, you know, try, try to do that and just to examine you know, what are the properties of the Hamiltonians that you get? That is, for example, what allows us to, to tell that, that we get Hamiltonians which are not too complex, right? Or actually uh, uh, as little complex as they can be. So for instance, when we are increasing, you find what you expect? Yes. You uh, find the definition and you can ignore yes, it. And we, yeah, yes, and we can find that this is informationally the, the best. We can find that for 2D, you, you get, you, you know, the, the, out of the all rules, none of them is great, but, but the majority uh, is the best. And, and you know, I, I'll show you a little bit more complicated models also. Um, okay, and you could also think of doing this for these order distributions, right? Th then we would have to have another loop uh, here outside by basically, uh, you know, uh, running over samples of these order realizations, right? Quench these order realizations, but that of course would be computationally very costly. So, can you do this over on, uh, on yes, well, I mean, but you know, let's say here we, we deal only with translation invariant systems, so you only did, do, do it for one for one block really. But but if you did with this order, then you would. Then in principle, you could you could assume that you know, like is strong in this order R G, the sort of the, the local the local rule you know you know depends on, on on the environment. It's not one rule for everything. Okay. Okay. So, so what is the problem with estimating mutual information? Well, in general, it's a difficult problem, right? It's uh, it's computational difficult. You you always have to you know have some problems with you know getting either high high bias or or variance. And moreover, we're not. You know, we're not really interested in, in just getting some estimate of, of mutual information of those two, two variables. We want something more specific. We want that it is parametric. We want that we can compute the gradients of it efficiently. And, and uh, what I will also explain is that we kind of want that it is a lower bound. Okay? And uh, why, why do we want that it's a lower bound? Because you know, the, the ANSAT itself is supposed to be improving by, by growing the, the mutual information. If the estimator is also a lower bound which can be improved, so, th so th you know that your whole setup is a, is a lower bound to the true mutual information, right? So then you can kind of tr try to train them together, right? And uh, you know, without, to, without having, for example, to have some mean max type story, right? So that's, that's why we would also want a lower bound. So sometimes you're lucky, and in this case, we, we are lucky, because it turns out that people in machine learning have, for different reasons, been interested in the question of maximizing mutual information or, or you know, deriving uh, new bounds for, for mutual information. And this goes under the name of um, var you know, variational bounds for, for mutual information. Okay, and so I will not have time to kind of you know describe the subject in detail, but I want to give you the flavor. How how does it go? And and the fl so this is not describing the, the the precise particular bound that we're using, but I think it gives the the, the, the good idea. So it kind of starts from basically from Gibbs uh, inequality, which bas which basically tells you that the Kullback library divergence is non is non-negative. In particular, if you have some you know two random variables x and y, and you have their true joint p of x and y, and you have some conditional probability distribution p you know, x conditional y, you can, you can, you can take some, any random, you know, distribution q x conditional on y, which you can kind of think of a test function that you will be I improving. And if you plug it into this, you know, this, this Gibbs inequality and massage the formula just a little bit for, for, for this, you know, uh, you know, test ansatz q, you can derive the following, you know, once you massage this formula a little bit, you realize that you can, that you can get mutual information there on one side. Right? It, it allows you to arrive a lower bound of the mutual information, which involves the function q. In fact, this bound becomes tight when q is equal to p. Okay, but so so this is a kind of an, a, a, you know a nice result because you'd say, well, maybe wha wha I, I can I can be ha having this bound and be improving it. You know, let me let me take q to be a neural network, right, or something something like that. And I and I and I'm basically looking for you know trying to improve that that bound. So that's that's kind of good beginning. Uh, the b so you know, it's a lower bound. It's tight when when q is equal to p. You can you can try to kind of you know improve q, but the problem is that it contains this this entropy, which is difficult to to evaluate. And moreover, it's something that you're totally not interested in, right? You know that you're really interested in mutual information, so you're interested on the dip, you know be in the dependencies between x and y, and not interested in in you know what's in what's sitting inside x, which is what entropy tells you. Okay, so the next step you can do is you can actually take a smart ansatz for for this conditional probability q x on y and, and basically parameterize it like this. So the, the key element here, so it's an energy based ansatz, the key element here is this function f x y, which is called the critic. And again, think of it at the end of the day, this will be a neural network, okay? So if you plug this here, you, 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 you realize that you know, you, you'll get, you'll cancel the entropy term, but you'll get something which looks like, like an expectation of the log of z, 
So there will be expectation of log of the partition function. And then you might ask, how do I massage this, this further? And there's a couple of ways to do it. In some ways, you lose the fact that it's a, that it's a lower bound. That's bad. I don't want to tell you exactly how you do it, but you can derive a specific lower bound due to Nguyen, Wainwright, and Jordan, which is a lower bound. It is still uh, uh, tight. And it has a very nice interpretation. You see that you're basically comparing expectation of f or some, you know, some function of, of f in the true joint and in the product, right? So the function f, as you improve it, this, bound, this, this lower bound will become, you know, uh, will become tight. And the function basically will you know, learn to give you a signal that helps you to distinguish whether the points came from, this you know, from, the, from a true distribution, from a true joint, or from the product, OK? So, uh, if you want to learn, so well, we we don't use this. We learn, well, we use a sort of you know a, a algorithmically slightly better uh, uh, version of that. And if you want to learn that, I I, uh, I I very much recommend this this kind of paper. It's it's great and contains a lot of information. And so you know, it has the results of its own, but but it's possibly the the nicest review of of uh, such variational bounds on, on mutual information. So at the end of the day, you know, forget about that. Think that you have this kind of cost function, which you know, involves computing some expectations of some critic function, okay? And this function will be uh, a, a, a neural network, right? So this will be your, your estimator, and you'll be trying to, to you know, change the, the parameters of that neural network in such a way that this estimate gets larger and larger, right? And, but, uh, and, but you're guaranteed that it's always, that it's always bounded from above by, uh, by the true mutual information. So that's, that's cool. So now you know, okay, we, you know, in our whole setup, we need three elements, right? And the three elements are we need the coarse grainer. We need, we need something which ensures, well, I mean, there's a very puzzling sounding differentiable discretizer. What we, you know, if the, the coarse, the, the, you know, whatever you're using to coarse grain your system with should preserve the form of the degrees of freedom you choose. So if you decide that you're going to, you know, taking spins and producing a block spin, then the output of your, of your coarse grainer should also be a block spin, not, for example, a continuous variable. Because if this is the case, and then you plug it into the estimator for the mutual information, it will be thinking it, it's dealing with continuous distribution, and your, your, your final answer might be actually wrong because of that. And I can, in fact, show examples where it will be wrong. Okay? So, so there's three elements, one in, in here. The, it's very simple. This element is basically just a simple linear convolution with, with, the, with the visible block. The environment you, know, you, 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 you feed unchanged into, into the, the, the next stage. The, the filters you, f you, f you feed through this discretizer. So now, of course, is the question, how do you make it discrete, and yet you'll be able to pull the gradients through? And uh, uh, I will not tell you the details, but it ties actually to this uh, reparameter reparameterization trick that, uh, that Max Welling talks, uh, talked about. So there, it turns out that there is something like that that you can do for categorical uh, uh, distribution. And so I, I give you the, the, the references to, to figure this one out. But it's basically possible to construct a discretization which has a parameter which describes how smooth it is. So like in the, in, the limit, in the limit of, let's say, this parameter being infinite, it is perfectly uh, you know, steep, right? So it's really a, comp a discrete variable of exactly the kind of shape that you want. And in the limit, you know, if you relax it, you smooth it a little bit, and you're able to, to compute the gradient. So you'll be able to anneal uh, through that, right? So kind of tune it to, to be more, more discrete. So the whole setup is like this. You, you have your filters that is what, what you really want to train. You, uh, you construct the new coarse grain variables. You feed together the environment. You fit that together into your estimator for the mutual information, which is another, which is another network, and you know, and, and that, and that you, you, you know, the outcome of that you fit into the score function, which is this, this estimator for the for the mutual uh, for the mutual information, the, speci the specific expectation value that you that you have. Okay, and so of course there is now a choice for what kind of critic function you choose, and there is whole literature on you know what you should do that that works very very nicely. OK, I, I will not talk, talk about the, the details of architecture. But at the end of the day, there is something which is you can code it in TensorFlow in totality. You can train it in one go, right? So you don't need to run uh, before we had nested Monte Carlo, some, some crazy stuff. You really can train it by gradient descent, OK, based on the Monte Carlo samples that you have. And in the training, simultaneously, your estimator and your coarse graining filter improves, OK? So I don't want to bother you more with, with technical details. I told you already, uh, you know, in answers to Gerard's questions, that uh, that it finds the correct RG rules for like some trivial models like like easy and stuff like this. Let me show you something a little bit more interesting, and this more interesting thing is the interacting Dimer model. So um, 
we like dimer models for whatever reason. So what is this interacting dimer model? Okay, it's a statistical mechanical model. Think of a square lattice. The bonds can be occupied, unoccupied. But the particularity of this one is that there is a constraint, set of local constraints. Every vertex has only one occupied, one and exactly one occupied bond on it. Okay. So turns out, so this is the non-interacting dimer model, fully packed non-interacting dimer model. And then you can add an additional term, which is you can you can add you can add an energy function, which basically wants the dimers to be aligned. Okay. And so your partition function, if there is no interaction, just counts the con valid configurations. And uh, you know, if, if there is energy, well, that it looks like that. So it turns out that this model has non-trivial physics. And there's basically two ways to understand it has non-trivial physics. For, you know, no, by, by non-trivial physics, I mean, for example, that there is some sort of long-range uh, long properties, right? So it it's actually turns out it's a critical system with algebraic decay of correlations. And you can see that, OK, it really originates because you, you, you have those, um, those constraints, which sometimes make it so that if you want to flip a certain dimer, you'll have to flip the dimers all across the system to the other side, right? Which kind of mediates some form of uh, you know, correlation. So that's, that's one way to understand why there could be some sort of long range properties on the system. The other way is that you know, the way you actually solve those things is you map them to a height model. So you basically, you basically introduce a fictitious surface that lives above those dimers. And there's a height above every plaquette. There's sort of a consistent way to assign that height. And you, 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 you realize that you know, once you write the theory of that, it looks effectively like it's a theory of electrical fields which obey you know, Gauss law. So there is a conservation of, sort of, 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 of flux. And you know that that's why there is an actual uh, long range uh, physics in the system. This is just for the non-interacting dimer model. This will also tell you that the configurations that actually correspond to the electrical fields, let's say fl you know, electrical field in x or y directions, are, are those staggered dimer configurations. And you, you, uh, you know, if you, if you stare at it a little bit, you realize that those are exactly the ones in which you cannot flip the dimers without flipping a lot of other dimers. Okay. So you're saying it's critical whatever the time function. Uh, yes. Well, I mean, if you start, you know, if you start uh, adding adding the, the the interacting term, then no. So what, what happens if you add the interaction? Well, then, be, then, then, this is the, then, the, then, this, then this whole situation becomes more difficult. And it's more difficult because you see, well, it's, very, it's fairly clear to see that if the, if the interaction is very strong, then you'll want to be in a sort of symmetry broken state where you have sort of columnar ground states, OK? And you can, you can have four of them, you know, two vertical related by translation and two, and two kind of you know, horizontal. In, this, in, in here, you're, you're in this critical system. Turns out that, you know, um, there's sort of some understanding of this model. Turns out that this is whole, it, it is a whole critical line. So all of those systems are critical, in fact. And the critical exponents depend on temperature. Okay? So basically here there is a costarlitz starless trans transition. And then you see kind of representative configurations. Okay, here you have the broken symmetry states. Here, okay, I, I'm here basically it should be related to electrical fields, okay? And those look like staggered dimer configurations. And here there are some mysterious plaquette correlations, okay? Now, I'll, I'll tell about li you a little bit about the plaquette correlations. So this is what we have. And now what you can do is you can generate Monte Carlo samples of this model, right, and feed them at, you know, at, at, at all the values of, of, of let's say, the, the interaction to your you know, network, train it, and see what you get, what kind of things it thinks are, are important for the physics of the system. So here is exactly the picture that I was alluding to before. And it's kind of you know, you know, aligned. So you see that really what it picks up. So OK, how should you think of those filters? Really think of it like this. This, this is the block of, let's say, 8 by 8 sites in the original Daimler model. And there are only two variables here. And what you see, the strength of the kind of dependence of this variable on the underlying things in the block. So what you see is that those two variables effectively pick up columnar ground states if you're, if, if you're in this kind of parameter regime. If you're in this parameter regime, they pick up some sort of plaquette correlations. And if you're here, you, you see those diagonal filters. I, I have not, no, no time to explain. But they basically correspond to uh, EX plus EY and EX minus EY. So they really pick up the, the electrical fields. And now I think the, the, the really interesting thing here is, is the, the plaquette correlations, because this is actually an artifact of, of, a, of a finite site. So Ale actually has a very interesting insight. So how, you know, how would you know that there are even plaquette correlations to look at? Right? So, so there is a, an insight that comes from study of quantum diver models where there actually is a plaquette phase. So you know, uh, you can, you, you know, if you look at the, at the energy function of this model, you, you, you realize that you, know, you lower your energy if you, if you perfectly align all, all, the, um, you know, all the dimers in the columns. But you can think of, of plaquettes that are also aligned with each other. 
right? So on every plaquette, the, the, the two dimers are kind of let's ver vertical, and the plaquette below also two dimers are vertical, right? But in, in quantum system, you could also lower energy by kinetic energy. So you, could, you can create kind of a resonant state where, where you gain some energy by, by, by having a superposition of, of being aligned this way or aligned that way. And there, there is a regime where this is an actual phase. So quantum dimer model has a plaquette phase. So that's why they said, why don't we examine if there are plaquette correlations also in the, in the classical system? And they actually find from, you know, if you, if you see at the scaling, is that those plaquette correlations appear around the critical point. But in fact, it is not a phase because it diminishes as you increase the system size. So this is not a true phase, but those plaquette correlations are important. So we don't need to know anything about plaquette correlations. You know, you, you kind of understand from, from here that it picks up, yeah, this is what's important for mediating the correlations in, in, in the system, right? So, um, okay, uh, I'll have to go fast on, on this because I still want to say a few words on, the, on, on this relevance question. But I want to tell you one thing. So, you know, normally when you do RG, right, you, you, you plug in some RG rule and then you basically analyze the flow. But here, we, we didn't, I, I never told you anything about the flow. I was talking, you know, t telling you about the filter, like extracting some relevant degrees of freedom, which, which seems some, you know, conceptually slightly different thing. And, and it is different, right? Because, you know, if you plug in the filter by hand, the filter doesn't have any information about the system that you did not put in, right? But this one is not one that I put in by hand. It's, it's explicitly gathering all the relevant information. So I can extract a lot of information by analyzing the filters, analyzing the statistics, and analyzing how much mutual information can be retained. What, you know, what's the optimal top value of the mutual information that you get with the optimal filter? So I want to very quickly flash, flash some, some slides. So for instance, you see this is the, the max value of mutual information that you get, as also as a function of buffer size when you train the filter to, to convergence. And you see, for example, here is log four. Why log four? Because there are four ground states. That's all the information that is there. That, that's what you pick up. What's going here? So here, I'm, you have to believe me that this converges, but not to zero on the critical side, right? And so it converges to some finite value, which is lower than log two. Therefore, it cannot be a symmetry broken state because there are no, let's say, two symmetry broken state, anything like this. There's some finite value of mutual information. It's not symmetry broken state. It has to be critical state. So you can, you can, you can infer it's a critical state. You know, uh, we know from, from other kind of works, is that if you have a divergent derivative of mutual information somewhere, that usually signals a critical point. So you can understand that there is a, there's a symmetry broken state, a critical phase, a phase transition just by examining this curve. Okay, now you can you can do further further things, but I, I don't really have, have time. This you know so here is an example for the easing model. I have five minutes, so I will not be, be talking about this. You can you know one thing that, that we we analyze here is you know we looked at those filters and we kind of try to analyze what are their frequencies in different regimes of the parameters and you know they appear where they need to be. But there is a you know sort of an ad hoc choice here that we did, in the sense that I I said I'm going to look at columnar filters whatever because by eye I see them right. But you could, you, what you could do is you could basically just train the ensemble of those filters and do data analysis on that to understand what are the relevant things that, that pop up, right? And here, we actually, we, you know, we did that. So we, we did PCA on the filters, and you realize that the PCA components correspond to those things, right? So you could kind of make it, uh, I still have five minutes, right? Yeah, for discussion. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me, okay, one minute. That's, fine. that's very fine. Uh, two minutes? Very good. Uh, I'd love a discussion, but I still would want to tell you a little bit uh, about this, this more formal thing. Okay, so what is this, this uh, uh, sort of more formal connection? Right, so <coughs> in information bottleneck, you define the problem as follows. You, you have uh, some variable, you want to compress it to some, you know, to, to well, some, you know, let's say com variable x compressed to variable x tilde, and you want to preserve as much information about possible as about the variable y, okay? And it's phrased as a Lagrangian problem, so there is the information that you kind of you know, have about what you're compressing, the information that you really care about. So there's a trade-off, right? So, and, and what you do is you're trying to find the optimal encoder that, that is the minimum of, 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 of that Lagrangian. And there is a set of iterative equation that, that you know, can give you the solution, okay? Now, what is kind of important to, 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 to uh, and okay, whatever, what is kind of important to, to, to realize that as, as you as you tune the parameter beta, you get different solutions for your encoder. So initially, actually, what turns out is that the encoder is trivial. Like, if, if the beta is too small, then you actually care too little about preserving anything meaningful. And it's the best, it's best that you can do is to compress as much as you can. And as much as you can means compress totally. So create an encoder that is actually uniform. It doesn't care. P, let's say P, H, conditional on V, doesn't care about, about V. It's just 1 over H. It's uniform on H. 
it's only at some finite value of beta where encoder breaks the symmetry. So it turns out that there is a sort of uh, an understanding of this is that as you tune the beta, there's a sequence of symmetry breaking, permutation symmetry breaking transition, permutation of the symbols that you have in your alphabet, okay? So first we can show that what our system, what, 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 you know, what we do corresponds to basically having a limit of beta being infinity here, but under the constraint that the size of the alphabet is fixed. So let's say I, I, I have a block spin of, or, you know, my, my, my block variable is a spin, right? So it has two states. So that's my alphabet. And I, I, I'm tuning beta to infinity, but I will never be able to, to produce another symbol in my alphabet to make a sort of better compression, okay? So that's the first thing that we understand. And with this understanding, we can try now to connect those two notions. So in IB, there is the relevant information that you, that you try to retain. In RG, there is some relevant operators. How do you connect them? So it turns out that the transfer matrix is the, is the, is the tool to do so. Why transfer matrix? Because in, you know, in the transfer matrix, so the transfer matrix is, you know, is, a, is a very attractive formalism because on the one hand, I can express all the quantities that go into the IB equations as quantities related to the transfer matrix. So I can, I can for example, express some you know, things. So this, those are the IB equations you know, for, the, for the encoder. And I can express, for example, you know, of course, the partition function I, I, I can express as the trace of the, you know, the transfer matrix to the appropriate power. But the matrix elements of the transfer matrix and, and its uh, sort of you know, partial marginalizations give you all those other quantities, like pH conditional X, P, E, you know, conditional uh, on H, so forth. So on the one hand, I can try to solve IB equations with all those quantities coming from a transfer matrix of a, of a, of a physical system. Okay? On the other hand, I know that transfer matrix uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors are related to the actual scaling operators in, in, in this sort of continuum uh, 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 description of the model. So in particular, basically, the eigenvalues of the transfer matrix will give you scaling, op scaling dimensions of the primary operators in, in the CFT if this is a critical system. So I can basically compute those two things. And I want to finish by basically saying we show that the encoders you get only depend on sort of the lowest eigenvalues of the transfer matrix. And we can explicitly solve this, let's say, for critical to the easing model, blah, blah, blah. We have a prediction for where is the critical temperature if the system that you're solving is to the easing model. We can solve the IB equations without transfer matrix explicitly, see where the encoder first breaks the symmetry. That prediction is accurate to like five, or five digits. So, so we, really, we really get this. So what is the message, the, the last sentence that I want to say out of all this? The message is, this that, you know, if you think of it this way, the relevant information that the kind of, you know, it's picked up with this whole buffer construction, you know, via, via this I, I, IB reasoning is the one, is the relevant information that contain, that, 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 that corresponds to basically matrix elements of the primary operators in your, in your, in your field theory. So what you're learning in those, in those filters is really the relevant, physically relevant information, not just some, uh, you know, hand wavy relevant information, okay? And I, uh, that's 46 minutes. I apologize for going over time. So let's take a short break. Let's take the discussion for the break. And, and then we will go on with the, with the future theory. At, at what? 6.30? At 6.35. Lenka.